Uh, thank you to ACL Sonoma County for having me here, and uh, especially to Steve Fabian for organizing this event. Um, I'd also like to say uh, I'm not worthy of, of following the inspirational May Nakano, so I'd just like to give her one more round of applause. So uh, I, have a, I have a PowerPoint presentation I'm going to give here, but as it warms up, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the organization I work for, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, we are a digital civil liberties organization. If you haven't heard of us, uh, we're based in San Francisco. And we do all sorts of work with internet law, whether it's free speech, privacy, copyright and fair use, or computer crime law. Uh, some people like to refer to us as the ACLU of the internet. Uh, and that said, the ACLU does wonderful work on the internet and with technology law, and that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about today, is, is how EFF and ACLU uh, are tackling this problem of surveillance drones. So, this picture right here is a Predator drone. I'm sure most, if not all of you, have seen it before. Uh, it's been used by our military in the last decade uh, to kill over 4,000 people in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, and elsewhere. Uh, this military weapon, which has killed many civilians, um, along with uh, terrorist suspects, uh, is shrouded in secrecy. The government, despite the fact that it is on the front pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post almost daily now, they refuse to admit in court that it, the program even exists. The ACLU has been doing just wonderful work trying to bring light to this secret CIA program. Uh, they have multiple lawsuits out right now uh, trying to get the CIA to admit that this program uh, exists, let alone bring some accountability to it. There was a just amazing and, and, and bizarre legal ruling about a couple months ago. A judge uh, in the district court said that she couldn't bring the CIA to admit to the program because of the convoluted laws of the federal, the, the transparency laws of the federal government saying it was something out of Alice in Wonderland. The uh, appeals court thankfully overruled her and uh, the government is now being forced to admit that this program uh, finally exists. Whether or not we're going to get greater transparency and accountability uh, is remains to be seen. But this is, you know, a very complicated issue and actually not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is domestic drones. Now, uh, as many of you may have heard in the last couple months, uh, drones are actually coming to America. They'll, in a few years, there will actually be more drones flying over the U.S. skies uh, than, they, than there will be overseas. Now, these aren't exactly necessarily these Predator drones that we see here. They won't have missiles attached to them. Uh, but they will be, come in all shapes and sizes. So this is actually what a uh, domestic drone looks like today. As you can see, it kind of almost looks like a toy, but it really is not. Uh, you can actually buy these uh, online for about $300 to fly your own, but the police departments around the country are starting to buy them uh, much more sophisticated units than this that cost upwards of fifty dollars or $100,000 or more. So, um, I, I, Imam mentioned in his opening that uh, these come in other shapes besides this as well, and I want to emphasize that that is absolutely true. You can go online and then see a video of the head of DARPA, the Defense Department's research arm, uh, have a uh, show a demonstration of a hummingbird drone, which is exactly like a hummingbird, and it, would, it flies around the stage and lands on our shoulder. Uh, Harvard University is now working on uh, drone swarms that are the size of insects, uh, basically five ounces in weight. So uh, I, I encourage you all to go on YouTube and, and look up these videos of these. Uh, you can see them live in action. Um, but so, you know, the, the next thing I want to talk about is what these drones can do exactly. So the Predator drones we saw before, uh, you know, have really sophisticated high-definition cameras that can basically see your shoelaces from a mile away. 
Uh, you know, the, the domestic drones that the police officers, that the police agencies are buying now, excuse me, have the same, have slightly less capabilities as far as high definition photography goes, but still very strong. Uh, but not only that, they can be equipped with heat or infrared sensors on their cameras, which can literally see through walls. Uh, they can be equipped with facial recognition technology. Uh, they can also be equipped with cell phone interception technology so they could suck up potentially your text messages and phone calls. They could also lock on to the, to the GPS of your cell phone and, and potentially follow you around. Um, as I'm sure many of you being ACLU members know, uh, you know, the cell phone is, is, is a huge advance in technology and is an intimate part of pretty much all of our daily lives, but it's also become a tracking device. It sends a signal back to a cell phone tower every 7 to 15 seconds and that can track your movement for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, when you look on your iPhone and you, you look at Google Maps and you see that little blue dot when you're lost and you're trying to find your way around, you have to realize that that information is going back to a server somewhere and is being stored. And the police can, can get this information whenever they want. Uh, they don't think they need a warrant for it. They think they can just get it with a subpoena. Uh, the same thing goes with... Uh, if they were ever to lock on your GPS of your, your cell phone with a drone, it could potentially follow you around for hours or days at a time, you wouldn't know. Um, you know, unless you actually saw the drone in the sky. Uh, and, you know, the, these manufacturers of these drones, they even openly admit that they are manufactured to carry what they call less lethal weapons, which are tasers or, and rubber bullets and beanbag guns. Now, uh, you know, many people are outraged as soon as they hear about this, and there's a few laws that are being discussed that we're going to talk about later that uh, will ban these outright. But just so you know, there is a sheriff in, in Montgomery County in Texas who has already said that he would like to use these types of weapons for, to, uh, to combat protesters or, or use them for large crowd control. So it's definitely something we need to keep an eye out for. Um, but so, you know, what I'm talking about here are these small drones that are about three to four feet long. But I, and you know, it's important to differentiate these, um, these drones with the Predator drones, which are the size of an airplane. But it is also important to point out that there are Predator drones in the U.S. as well. Uh, along the Mexico and Canada border, uh, the Department of Homeland Security now owns ten of them. Uh, they would like to own about 14 more. Uh, they fly on the border uh, looking for people crossing the border illegally. And actually in the immigration bill that is going through Congress right now, uh, there, is, there is literally a provision that's, that will require drones to be flown 24 hours a day, 7 days a week along the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, this is usually buried in news articles, but you can read about it in the USA Today and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the uh, uh, bill that was introduced by California Senator Dianne Feinstein would reduce the amount of the length that these drones can go uh, inland um, from 100 miles to 25 miles. But you should also know that the Department of Homeland Security doesn't really know what to do with these drones sometimes, so they actually loan them out to local police agencies. Uh, they admit that they do this, but they don't admit uh, how much they do this or for what purposes. So at EFF, we've actually sued DHS under the Freedom of Information Act to try to get more of this information. Uh, no results yet, but hopefully uh, we're getting there soon. Uh, you know, so right now, these, uh, so I want to go back to small drones for, for a minute, which all the police agencies across the U.S. will, um, if they're not buying right now, will buy very soon because uh, of something called the FAA Modernization Act, which was passed back last February 2012. This bill uh, was, uh, it was, it was a giant bill. It, it solved a lot of problems, it updated a lot of the systems in the FAA, but buried in the middle of it was one paragraph that basically mandated that the FAA start handing out drone authorizations to any public agency that wants them. Uh, they just have to prove that they can fly the drone safely. And so uh, this was basically written by the uh, defense industry lobby, which actually had now has an offshoot of, and it's uh, a drone lobby. Uh, it's called the AUVSI. Um, and they admit, actually, that the um, Congress 
took their language pretty much word for word because nobody really knew this was in the bill be before it passed. Uh, and so once this bill was passed, the FAA actually said that uh, there will be 30,000 drones in the sky by the end of the decade. And so there are about 19,000 towns in the U.S., so that's more than one for every town. Uh, and so the question is, what can we do to protect our privacy? Unfortunately, the law just hasn't kept up with technology. Uh, there are a couple Supreme Court cases from 10 or 20 years ago that talk about aerial surveillance. Unfortunately, they didn't go the right way. So there was one called California versus Serralo, where there was uh, a fence, a, a fenced-in yard, which the police thought may contain, may, uh, the person who lived there may be growing marijuana, they couldn't see over the fence. So they rented a plane that flew a thousand feet above his house, and they were able to see in his backyard he was growing marijuana. This was challenged up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that actually the, the person did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and so anybody can potentially rent a plane uh, to look into your yard, uh, despite the fact that a fence may prevent you from seeing it from the ground. Uh, there was also another case called Florida versus Riley, which um, it was another marijuana case where somebody was growing marijuana in a greenhouse in their backyard. Again, the, the cops couldn't see what was going on, so they, they rented a helicopter this time, flew 400 feet above the greenhouse, could see in the windows, and saw that they were growing marijuana. And again, the Supreme Court ruled that this was not a reasonable expectation of privacy. So, when you're outside, the Supreme Court, at least for now, thinks that you don't have privacy. And that's a huge problem. So now at EFF, we believe actually you do have privacy in your movements outside. When you're going, uh, you know, when you're walking to your work, to your home, to your friend's house, to the bar, to church, to anywhere you want to go, if somebody is following you around for, for for days or weeks at a time, they can learn pretty much everything about you. They would know more about you than some of your closest family members. And we believe this should be protected by the Fourth Amendment. So the open question is whether courts will get here. Um, but that's a question for down the road, because unfortunately this, probably, this won't come up for uh, years down the road, especially if it gets to the Supreme Court. We have to realize, you know, email has been around for, for more than 20 years now, yet in a case uh, talking about your email privacy has, has yet to reach the Supreme Court, so we still have a long way to go. But uh, we will get to solutions in, in a few minutes, but I just want to talk um, a little bit about what the ACLU and the FF have been doing around this issue. So uh, before this, this FAA Modernization Act passed, uh, the ACLU was already on this case. It was amazing. Before anybody even knew this was an issue, back in 2011, they wrote a white paper, which you can read online, uh, which talks about protecting privacy from aerial surveillance, specifically drones. Uh, now, this paper was written by uh, Jay Stanley, which many of you may know. He works for ACLU National, and he writes, is the editor of the Free Future blog on ACLU.org, which I encourage everybody to check out. He's just a fantastic writer, very easy to understand, and talks about these issues uh, pretty much daily. Um, yeah, so, so part of the, the problem here is that actually we don't know a lot about what people, what police agencies are doing with drones. So, you know, when, when I was saying before, the military has this culture of secrecy surrounding drones in the military overseas. Well, it's kind of spread to the United States for these domestic drones. So even though the FAA uh, releases all sorts of information, they're very transparent actually about, about manned aircraft. So if, you know, who's flying the aircraft, what type of aircraft, why it's flying, all this information is publicly available, but um, for some reason with drones, they refuse to release any of this. Uh, they won't even tell us, uh, originally they wouldn't tell us who was flying them. So we actually had to sue them under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, finally, they started releasing this information last year. It's been trickling out. Uh, they usually release information that's, that's three or four months behind, and the lists are incomplete, but we know over 100 agencies have already applied for and, and received drone licenses, uh, and more are applying every day and every week. So they started releasing this information, uh, and almost immediately, journalists started jumping on it. This was an issue nobody knew about, but all of a sudden, just because we released about 100 uh, police agencies' names and universities, uh, you know, every paper in the country was covering this. So uh, a reporter got a hold of this information in Seattle, 
Uh, Seattle was probably one of the biggest cities on this list. And the reporter called up city council and asked, what do you, did you guys approve uh, the purchase of two drones for the Seattle Police Department? And it turns out that the Seattle City Council had no idea that their police department had bought these drones. They found out about it through our lawsuit. Uh, so thanks to the ACLU of Washington, who again was on this issue much, months, months, and months before anybody knew about it, uh, they pressured the city council about this. The uh, sheriff had to go, or the, the police commissioner had to go before the city council and apologize for this, and promised to work with the ACLU of Washington to work on binding standards uh, for operating drones before they ever flew. So they were actually one of the first police stations to have them ready to fly, and yet partially because of ACLU Washington and partially because of our lawsuit, uh, they were kept from doing so. Uh, you know, this actually turned into a huge political issue in uh, Seattle. There was protests every time that the police tried to have a public meeting about this. And there was even talk in the newspapers a few months ago that if city council didn't pass laws to require warrants for drone surveillance, that they would lose their seats. And so what ended up happening was uh, the Seattle mayor just decided to after, just cancel the drone program. It was a huge victory for uh, privacy and civil liberties. You know, victories that sometimes we're not used to seeing, especially with the And so, you know, this is, this is very inspiring, and we wanted to do something that could kind of promote this type of behavior across the country. And yet, unfortunately, again, like I said, we don't really know what they're doing with these drones. You know, we only have their, some of their names, we don't, we don't have the other names, but we don't know what they're using that for. So at EFF, we decided to partner with a, a new website called uh, Muckrock. Muckrock is a uh, Freedom of Information Act website. It allows normal citizens to file their own FOIA requests. Uh, they basically you just go to their website, muckrock.com, fill out a simple form, and they will see your Freedom of Information Act request through the system, make sure that it doesn't get denied, and uh, then report about what the results afterwards. So we decided to create this uh, with Muckrock, this drone census, we call it the 2012 drone census. So we have people go online and fill out these forms, and we got almost 500 people filing Freedom of Information Act requests uh, to find out if their police agencies were using drones. Now, a lot of them came back and the police agencies were like, no, we're actually not interested. Uh, some, like San Francisco, when, when we uncovered documents showing the San Francisco Police Department, uh, internally was discussing the, the use of surveillance drones. Uh, it became a big issue. And then they, they, they denied to the press that they are interested in them anymore and basically have said that they won't pursue them. Uh, but the, the, the biggest case that we have uncovered involves Alameda County. Um, you know, a county right next door it includes Oakland, uh, and their sheriff, uh, pictured here, um, he was giving an interview in October of last year, talking about how he was about to, he wanted to test some surveillance drones, that a, a, a surveillance drone vendor was, was offering, uh, basically, to show a demonstration, he wanted to be a part of it. So he told the news agency that he wanted to use these drones for emergencies, uh, for you know high risk chases where a, a, a helicopter would normally be following, but this is much cheaper for search and rescue operations, missing children or disasters, and you know nobody can argue with that. You know there there actually are good uses for drones, searching for missing children, you know over a large area when you don't have ten or twenty helicopters could actually do some good, or dropping medical supplies uh, into natural, natural disaster areas. Uh, you know, this could actually be useful for this technology. Um, so, you know, who could argue with that? But then, in the very same sentence, after he said we would only use these drones in emergencies, he said, oh yeah, we use them to, to get the marijuana growers too. <laughs> and we were, we were like, what? You know? And, there, and unfortunately, there, like I was talking about before with the Supreme Court cases, there are no laws that protect 
people from this type of surveillance. With helicopters, it's actually, um, you know, they cost a lot. And the sheriff was saying that this is why they don't want helicopters, or they want to use drones instead of helicopters. Well, actually, just this cost is actually great for our civil liberties. Because it means that the police are only going to use helicopters in the worst of the worst cases, when there's true emergencies. When they, you know, even as, as bad as those cases were, they had a strong suspicion that somebody was breaking the law. Um, not that those laws were just, but at least they were using it in a way that wasn't affecting everyday, everyday people's privacy. Uh, but with drones, they could basically um, use them whenever they want. You know, they may cost a hundred times cheaper, but it doesn't mean they're going to save a hundred times the money. It means they're just going to use them a hundred times more. So what we did was we filed a public records request uh, with Muckrock, with Alameda, and we found their internal documents said that they wanted to use drones for what they said were intelligence gathering purposes, generalized surveillance, and what they called, quote, large crowd control. Now, this was different, it turned out, from what they told the Alameda County Board of Supervisors when they wanted to apply for uh, money to buy this drone. Uh, this is actually what the drone looks like. Uh, they told the Board of Supervisors they only wanted to use it for emergencies. And, you know, we had this document showing that actually that's, they wanted to use it for much, much more than that. So the, with the ACLU of Northern California and uh, their staff attorney um, and my partner in crime in this uh, venture is Linda Lai. Uh, she filed another public records request showing uh, the, the, the difference between what they said to the Board of Supervisors and what they said to get the federal grant to get this drone. And they tried to basically sneak this drone through the Board of Supervisors, get their approval without the public's opinion. It was a, it was a closed door hearing. We found out about this less than 24 hours before the hearing. So we released all of these documents we had. We called a press conference. And thankfully, uh, the Board of Supervisors said, oh, I'm sorry, it was actually a mistake that we put that on the agenda. We promise we didn't mean to. Agenda number 37 was like 68. Um, it was buried in there, but uh, apparently it was a mistake. And so they ended up uh, calling a public hearing, and we went there to testify this where this picture, picture came from. Uh, the ACLU and EFF testified talking about why we need binding rules. The, the county needs to pass rules. We can't just have the police write their own rules because they can break them unilaterally if they want. Um, you know, and, and this kind of slippery slope that we're worried about is was evident when the um, sheriff was talking at this hearing. You know, he, he talked about how he would only use these for serious crimes, for felonies. And then, Later on, during questioning, when somebody pressed him on that, he said, well, I don't want to lock myself into just felonies, you know. He decided, you know, it's, it's basically he wants a choice to use these drones for whatever he wants. Now, these drones, the Alameda County Sheriff wants, admittedly only fly for about a half hour to an hour at a time. But there is a drone called the Stalker drone, which is sold by Lockheed Martin, which is a big defense contractor. They sell the military. And now they're selling to, to drone operators in the U.S. Um, it's, it weighs 13 pounds, and uh, it's well within the FAA's weight limit. Right now you can only fly drones if you're in the U.S. under 25 pounds. Uh, and it, believe it or not, you can actually go on YouTube and, and see this on the Lockheed Martin YouTube channel. Uh, the drone is recharged by a laser from the ground, and it can stay, and they tested it, and it can stay in the air for two days. Uh, basically, they could just recharge it every couple hours from the ground, and never have to take it down. Uh, so this is the type of technology we're looking at two or three or five years down the road. So when the sheriff says that it'll, it'll only stay in the air a half hour, we don't have to worry about it. Yes, we do, because we need to worry about it, his next drone purchase, which could be coming, you know, this, the technology once now will be out of date in six months. So this has become kind of this amazing political issue around the country, you know. I think when we're talking about the ACLU or EFF, we're, a lot of times we're fighting uphill battles, especially when it com comes to surveillance around technology in the last decade. You know, we've had the NSA warrantless wiretapping program, we've had the Patriot Act, we've had many judicial decisions go against us talking about privacy in our cell phones and on our computers. Uh, but 
you know, this issue has kind of galvanized the public, uh, both the left and the right. Probably more, uh, it's more of a bipartisan issue than, than I've ever seen in, at EFF. And so here, in just in the last year, so starting in 2013, and keep in mind that uh, state legislatures usually open up in March, so this is probably only in the last two or three months. These are all the states that have passed, or I'm sorry, have introduced and are debating drug legislation that will actually protect people's privacy. This type of legislation will go above and beyond what the Supreme Court considers reasonable expectation of privacy right now. This will mean that police agencies will need a warrant and probable cause to, to use drones for surveillance. Uh, it means that they'll be deleting their data on these, uh, everything that they suck up, whether it's, you know, cell phone information or your location information or pictures, they'll be deleting it quickly. They won't be sharing it with federal agencies, these fusion centers that are all over the country that are just acting as these huge databases that everybody's information is getting pumped into. And some states are even banning them for surveillance outright. And now, you know, it's important to realize that in most of these laws, you can still use drones for 90 to 95 percent of what the police say they want to use them for, whether it's searching for missing children, um, you know, fighting forest fires, surveying natural disaster areas. You know, we don't want to. We don't want to necessarily inhibit that. We don't want to be anti-technology. And if they would get behind these laws, they would realize that they could actually do all of this stuff uh, while still protecting people's privacy. Unfortunately, that's usually not the case. They usually say they want it for one thing and then use it for another. Uh, but luckily, the legislatures are uh, at least right now on our side. Now there are. Uh, you know, the industry is fighting back against this. There are battles all over the country. A few have already passed. Florida has passed a drone bill. Their Republican governor signed it in after it passed unanimously in the, the House, in both the houses. Virginia, the same thing in Virginia, it was passed overwhelmingly in both houses. The Republican governor signed it. Uh, and Idaho also was the third state. And so all of these other states are, are, are passing them unanimously or close to, to unanimously. California just introduced a bill a few weeks ago. So um, the question is, you know, what can you do? You can definitely call your representative in California right now and tell them that you support the, this drone privacy legislation. The, the, the privacy legislation in California is unfortunately you know, not as strong as we would like. And so you can tell them to make it stronger. You know, I wish I followed Ashley's lead and brought you phone numbers so you can call them right now, but uh, I promise you, you can find them easily online if you can't find them now. Also, call your federal representatives because the Senate right now has three or four drone bills being introduced. Uh, you know, they're not moving right now, but if we make enough noise, then it's possible that they may pass the first meaningful privacy legislation in a decade or more. You know, if you know, it's impossible to get anything through Congress right now. Privacy <laughs> legislation is the hardest. Um, and so, if you want to track these these drone bills, you can, uh, the ACLU has a great web, uh, a great section of their website. You can go to aclu.org/dronelaws. Uh, they give a state by state breakdown and tell you what's in the legislation and whether you should support it or not, and tell you how to contact uh, your legislature. So. You know, I think, like I said before, that a lot of times we're faced with uphill battles. And so I want to leave you with the message that this is actually a battle we're winning. And we can continue winning if we just keep on fighting. So, uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for having me.